What can you do? What are you going to do? What are you willing to do in the midst of this crisis? See, there's a lot of things that we can do as a church. We can, we can help our neighbors. Maybe they can't get out, so we get them groceries. Maybe someone needs some help with some bills. Maybe someone needs a call, and we actually use those cell phones for more than checking social media and texting people. We call somebody, ask them how they're doing, how can we pray for them. As a church, we're trying to do that with those in our database uh, this past week and this coming week. Uh, what can you do to help others during this time? One thing that every single one of us can do to be the church is to be praying fervently. We, we, might be, we might be on our knees, as Pastor Rusty just said, we'd be praying, praying for God's will to be done. Well, today, it's an odd Palm Sunday. I wish I was looking at your faces rather than these screens, but on this Palm Sunday, we're coming and we're talking in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, where James is talking about prayer. And so let's look at the first couple of verses here, 13 and 14. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. You know, the suffering actually, it, it means are you going through uh, some sort of affliction? Are you, are you struggling through something? Is there a trial you're walking through? If so, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Uh, this is talking about that inside uh, cheerfulness, that, that joy that comes from the Lord that's inside. Even though our outward circumstances may not be joyful, inside we can be cheerful. Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Well, we understand sickness. We understand what, what is meant there. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It's interesting that James says in every one of these uh, situations, there's one response. We look to the Lord. We pray. We praise. We pray. We call for others to pray. And it's like James is telling us, Christian, Christ follower, if you're truly his, everything is to be funneled through him something happens, go to him. You're excited, go to him. You're worried, go to him. You're anxious, go to him. You need some healing, go to him. Call on the elders. We, we see that James is saying, pray. And not only pray, but have a faith-filled pray. There, there's a lot of people who pray uh, that it's not faith-filled. It's, it's prayer about what can I get or what's in it for me. And, and there's even lots of prayers that are offered every single day to false gods, millions of gods around the world. But we're talking about faith-filled prayer to the one true God who created us in his image. Here's what we know. Faith-filled prayer works. Faith-filled prayer works. Now, now, when we say faith-filled prayer works, I want to make sure you understand this. That doesn't mean that every time Jeff Isaacs prays for what Jeff Isaacs wants, that it's going to come true. That would be great. But that's also a Disney movie where you rub a lamp, right? That, that's not what it means. Faith-filled prayer works means that I am dependent upon God's sovereignty and for him to know what's best. And I, there's going to be a lot of things I pray for that don't go the way I want them to, but they're within his will. So faith-filled prayer works, not always the way we would like. I like how Douglas Moo uh, phrased this. He said, uh, here's a helpful observation. James' specific reminder that the prayer must be a prayer of faith. This faith, while certainly including the notion of confidence in God's ability to answer, also involves absolute confidence in the perfection of God's will. A true prayer of faith, then, always includes within it a tacit acknowledgement of God's sovereignty in all matters that it is God's will that must be done. That's what we're saying. It's God's will that must be done, right? I mean, that's prayer, calling out to the creator for what the creator wills, not what Jeff wants, not what you want, but what he wills. And it's beautiful when our prayers line up with that because we're more concerned with his will than we are our own. Pray if you have suffering or afflictions. Right now, COVID-19 is rocking the world, not in a good way. And there's fear and anxiety and death and, and all this stuff happening. People aren't able to see their loved ones. It's, it's crazy what's going on. And those are sufferings. Those are trials. And uh, I, I got this stat the other day off worldometrics.com. And it, it's, here's as of April 1st, here's an interesting thing. Sufferings and trials, talking about death. Listen to this. As of April 1st, 48,583 coronavirus deaths, which is way too many. But then there are 78,000 deaths of mothers during birth, 123,000 deaths of seasonal flu. And this is all in three months, the first three months of the year. 248,000 deaths caused by malaria, 425,000 deaths caused by HIV AIDS, 632,000 deaths caused by alcohol, 2,077,000 deaths caused by cancer. 
3,283,000 by communicable diseases this year. And here's another mind-blowing stat, 10,751,000 abortions in the first three months. Well, Jeff, why you want to give those grim totals? Because there's all kinds of sufferings and trials around this world. But we've got to realize, even in the midst of those, we call out to God. And James says, if you're suffering, if you're going through trials, call to God and pray. And we need to be praying for this thing. Prayer is not necessarily for deliverance from what you're going through, but for endurance of what you're going through and dependence upon the one who created you and desires you to be with them. Right? Paul, Paul was a man that we can look at as an example. He, he went through so much. I mean, just read in 2 Corinthians when he talks about everything he goes through. It's crazy. But then he writes to Timothy. And while Paul is in chains, he's in prison for being a Christ follower, he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 5, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. He says, Timothy, suffering is part of the deal. Not just for Christians, but for non-Christians. We live in a fallen world. Ever since Adam and Eve messed up, you and I have perfected that messing up. And, and we live in this fallen world. Well, as we continue to look at what he says next, he says, if you're cheerful, praise. If you're cheerful, sing praise. On the inside, we're cheerful. Outside circumstances may not be great. Some of us may have lost our jobs the past couple weeks. Some of us have, have family members that have passed on. Some of us have things that, that are going on in our life that it's not a real cheerful time in our lives, but inside we can be filled with the joy of the Lord because we have relationship with God through Jesus. He says, if you're cheerful inside, sing praise. I love doing this all the time, right? I, I love singing praise songs. I, I tell you, that'll get, me, that, that'll get me to change my mood whenever I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa is me, poor pitiful Jeff, wah, wah, wah. I'm doing my little pity party. You know, and then I, then I think, okay, let me put it on my Spotify worship playlist. L let me listen to uh, some songs that will write my spirit, write my heart. Man, I, I sing those praises, and all of a sudden, I'm in a different place because I realize this world is temporary. The things that I'm, I'm experiencing temporary, but he's eternal. And not only that, he's given me a way to be with him through his son, Jesus. I, I, I was so tickled this week. I saw a, a video of a man who had a wife who has Alzheimer's and she's in a, a nursing home and he doesn't get to see her because it's closed down and so they had her window opened a little bit and this old man was, was standing in the widow, uh, window of his wife's room and there she is with Alzheimer's and someone was videotaping this from her door and he just starts singing Amazing Grace. I mean, bellowing it out. I'd give you an example, but I'll leave it as a good illustration right now. He just starts singing. And his wife with Alzheimer's just starts singing. And the joy, you can just feel the joy. And as a, as a follower of Christ, you know, you know what? Even as she's in that suffering, he's cheerful, she's cheerful in, in knowing who they're singing to and what they're singing about and the amazing grace that comes through Jesus. Well, then he goes on and says, any of you sick, call the elders to pray. And they will anoint you with oil. I think there's a couple interesting things about this passage in James First of all, James assumes that there are elders in the churches where these Jewish Christians are. He doesn't say, if you have elders, he says, call the elders. And you say, why is that important, Jeff? Because that is biblical leadership in a church. We, as, as a church, we don't all go with what I say. I'm not a one-man show who gets to say oh, what we spend what on, what we get to do with ministry. That would be cool there for about five minutes. But we are a church that understands biblical leadership is eldership that match up with the qualifications that we see in the New Testament. And so James says, call the elders. Call the elders to pray. He even uses uh, anointing with oil. And our elders do this. If you want to be uh, right now with social distancing, different things, we're probably not going to come to a lot of homes. But uh, we have been praying over FaceTime and Zoom. And we will do whatever we can to pray for you. It it's interesting, as James talks about oil here, it's the only time in the New Testament where we see healing done with oil. Other times we see healings happen. But this time, James says, use oil. Why? Uh, it, now, God can heal with oil. God can heal without oil. But it's being a, a, this principle that uh, all the Jewish Christians would know that in the Old Testament, oil was used to consecrate, to set apart, to sanctify an object or a person for the Lord. King David, uh, when he was just a shepherd boy, Samuel came and, and, and poured oil over his head to anoint him before the Lord. 
When they got into the temple, there was anointing of things with oil, uh, objects that were dedicated, consecrated unto God. And so James is basically saying, hey, when you're sick, dedicate, offer yourself, consecrate yourself unto God and have the leaders of the church pray over you. It's a beautiful picture. If you need prayer, uh, man, call into the church, uh, talk to our guys online right now. Uh, we want to pray with you. There was a woman in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, we see her in the synoptics as well, but uh, she was having a problem. For 12 years, she couldn't stop bleeding. And, and she had gone to the doctors and done all these different things and nothing happened. Well, then Jesus was coming through town and, and she had heard about it. And so she got in the crowd and there's a big crowd around Jesus. And, and she thinks to herself this in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 21. If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. If I can just, I, I know how awesome he is. If I can just touch his garment, man, that's going to that's gonna heal me. I've gone through misery for 12 years. Jesus turned, and as we read in the synoptics, he felt the power go from him, and he said, who touched me? And his disciples were like, there's people all around you. I mean, you got a mob all around you. What do you mean, who touched you? Everybody touched you. He goes, no, I felt the power leave. And here's what he says to her in Matthew 9, 22. Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. Well, we know that Jesus had the power to do that. It was Jesus that healed her. But you know what he said? He said, your faith, dependent upon God, dependent upon me, has made you well. Your faith has healed you, this Greek word sozo, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. And the interesting thing is we, like that woman, we, we can be near Jesus. We, we have the relationship where we can be healed physically, spiritually. We're going to talk about those two differences here in just a second. We can be healed. Now, does this mean, as we look at James chapter 5, does this mean every time we have an infirmity that we go to God and pray for healing, he's going to heal us? No. Could he? Absolutely. God can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, why he wants. Why? Because he's God. And that's the sovereignty of God. Jesus healed many people. But he also didn't heal many people. It's not a, every time we pray in faith, we're going to be healed. It's just not the way it goes. Why does God heal some and not others? It's his prerogative. It's the sovereignty of God. Jesus said in Matthew, he said, God causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous and, and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. We live in a fallen world. It's been messed up since Adam and Eve. It continues to be messed up. Right now we see it messed up more than ever. And sometimes there's physical healing, sometimes there's not. There's a story in uh, the Gospels that talk about ten lepers. And these ten lepers uh, called out to Jesus. As Jesus was on his way in Luke 17, these ten lepers called out and said, The Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, Go to the priests and and do these things, and you're going to be healed. And you know what the Bible says? As they went, they were healed of their leprosy. And leprosy meant in that community that no one would be around you. You'd be an outcast. You'd be outside of what was normal. You wouldn't even be able to stay in shelter because nobody would want to be around you, right? You'd have to stay on your own. Uh, You'd be isolated, quarantined. And 10 of them went and were healed. But then one returned. Only one of the 10 came back to thank Jesus. And here's, here's what we read in Luke 17. We're not ten cleansed, Jesus answered. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to the one who came back, the leper, the, one of the ten that was cleansed, he said to that one, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. well wait a minute. Why, why would Jesus say your faith has made you well? He was already cleansed of leprosy. Because he was cleansed physically. But here Jesus is saying, you're cleansed spiritually. You're dependent on me. You're dependent upon God to make you right. Your faith has made you well. Spiritual healing is the most important thing. Right? And as, as we think about the virus, and we think about those other stats that I gave you earlier, you know what? We need to be praying for the cure. We need to be praying for those who are in the hospital on, uh, on ventilators. We need to be praying for those who are losing their lives and their families. We need to be praying for that. Believe me, uh, I pray for that daily, and I hope you do. But we need to be praying for them spiritually more than physically. 
Because this virus, they may beat it or it may beat them. It, 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 this life that we live is temporary. Whether they, they, they come out of the virus or they succumb to it, it's temporary. But the spiritual, the spiritual healing that is offered in Jesus Christ is eternal. And that's what we need to be praying for, more than the healing. We need to be praying for the spiritual healing and then the physical healing. Because if you have a physical healing and you don't have a spiritual healing where you're restored to God, then what's it even matter? It's prolonging your time before you go to hell. Man, we need to be praying for these things. Faith-filled prayer works. Let's go to the last part of our, our passage here, 15 through 18. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. That's that word, save, so so, uh, which means to make whole, to complete. That's why we can think of it as the spiritual si- side of things. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. All right? There, there it speaks to the spiritual again. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And here's here's this passage where James starts off and says, you want to be saved? You, you, You want to be healed? You want to be made whole? Then turn your life over to Jesus. It could talk to the spiritual side and the physical side because we also can be healed physically by God. God is still in the healing business, folks. He hasn't stopped. It's interesting in this, it says, and the Lord will raise him up. The Lord will raise him up. The person who's sick and call upon in faith, this faith-filled prayer that, uh, that is power of faith-filled prayer, you know, this is when we understand the power and what God gives us in that. We understand it has the power to move mountains. It has the power to save people's souls because of the cross and has power to heal disease. The power of faith-filled prayer is amazing. But it says, and the Lord will raise them up. It's not, if, if, if you come to me and say, Jeff, I need healing, I have, uh, I have the coronavirus, I have this or that, I will pray in the name of Jesus for your healing. I'll believe in that, uh, and I will trust in that. But it's not up to me. I'm not, I, I'm not the one that makes the healing happen. Neither are any of those guys on TV that say they do. If there is a healing that happens in the physical body, it is God doing the healing, not some miracle worker. I was tickled and disturbed one time when I saw one of these guys on TV who says that if you have faith, you won't be sick, right? He says, you have enough faith, you won't be sick. And as he was telling the story, he said he was home with a terrible, terrible cold or flu, and he was just there, and he had the chills and everything, which I'm like, well, okay, you've already said that if you had faith, that wouldn't happen, but okay, let's give you that. So you're sick. And then he was on TV, he was watching himself on TV, and his person on TV said, if you are sick right now and you need a healing, I want you to reach out your hand to me and you will be healed. And he says that he reached his hand out, and at that moment he healed himself (laughs) through the TV. Folks, I'm not here to bash anybody or say anything negative uh, about anybody, but I want to call bull right there. We don't heal, God heals. God's in charge of that. He can use us as instruments. Absolutely, I believe that, but God heals. God is a healer. He goes on to say that you need to confess your sins, confess with one another. And we're going to talk about that here in detail in just a second. So we'll we'll, we'll put a pin in that one, and we'll go to talk about Elijah. In verses 17 and 18, it talks about this prophet Elijah, who was the the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. And if you want to know a little bit about this story he's talking about, go to 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18 in the Old Testament. Elijah was a man that uh, sometimes he was, man, he was so on fire for God. Other times he was scared and he ran. He, I mean, a man like us. That's what James is saying. And he says his prayers, this righteous man, he was righteous because he was living for God. And that's how we are in Jesus. It says he was able to stop rain for three and a half years because of his prayers. And then he prayed again and it rained. I, I love the picture that James gives us. He was a man just like us. He wasn't some superhuman. He just depended upon God. The power of faith-filled prayer is in God, not us. Our faith can spur on that power, but it's all about God. The power of a, a righteous person, the power of the prayer of a righteous person is effective. 
efficient, right? It's the power to save. Here's the salvation message, right? Uh, If you call out to God and and you say, man, I, I realize that what I deserve because everything I've done against you, I've sinned against you in the world, I deserve to pay for my own sins in a real place called hell. I don't want to do that. I deserve that. But I know one thing, God, I know that you loved me enough, God, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins, that if I would call out and say, I'm sorry, God, and I would take Jesus' sacrifice and the blood that was shed to cover over my sins, then they're paid for through his blood and not through me going to hell. Calling out to God in a prayer of submission and salvation It's amazing. Some of you right now, you need to do that. You need to get on your knees right before God and say, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, Lord. I'm sorry I've gone against you. I want to be in relationship with you, so I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, which means save me from my sins, save me from hell, but Lord means he's going to be the boss of my life. He's going to be the one that I live for. He's my ruler. He's my master. Some of you need to do that today. Well, Jeff, you don't understand. No, I I do understand the power of faith-filled prayer is amazing, even to the point of dependence upon Jesus Christ's sacrifice to pay for our sins and our own salvation to come through that. Ah, It's an amazing trade-off. It doesn't even make sense. Salvation is huge. Uh, Jesus demonstrates this in Mark chapter 2. There's a story in Mark chapter 2 about some guys that that had a friend that was a paralytic. He was on a mat. He couldn't move anywhere. And these four friends thought, man, we're going to get him to see Jesus. So they go take him to see Jesus in Mark chapter 2. But the house is just packed. I mean, it's one of those ones where where you can't get in. You know, there's bodyguards at the door saying, "Uh uh-uh, we're at the limit. The fire marshal's going to shut us down. We're not going to do that. And these guys say, we're going to get in there. Don't care what you say. So they go up on the roof. They cut a hole in the roof, and they lower their friend down on a mat. Can you imagine this picture? Can you imagine being the homeowner? Hey, whoa, whoa, hey, who's going to pay for this? Well, I guess I got a sun sunroof here. As they lower him down, he comes, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And the religious leaders there, they just get all upset about this, and they're like, oh, how can he forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And here's what Jesus says in Mark chapter 2. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit what they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. (laughs) Jesus, he was awesome as he talked to religious leaders. But ultimately, he's saying, all right. I healed him spiritually, then I also healed him physically. And you can see that I'm the, I'm the great healer, I'm the great physician. You know, call to me, come near to me, and I will heal you. First important thing, spiritual healing, that we restore that relationship with God. Your sins are forgiven. What's God's guarantee on healing? Can I tell you this? God has a, and this, this may get me in trouble, but there is a 100% guarantee on God's healing if it's within his will. You can't leave that part off. If it's within his will, he's going to do what he wants to do. He's going to heal. I I will tell you that physically, we know that not everyone is healed, but spiritually, everyone, the Bible tells us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. That's a beautiful thing. Now, you may not be able to walk off your mat, but you can be saved. The power of prayer is amazing. For, for prayers to be powerful and effective, we need to be in that right relationship with God, right? Our, our prayers need to line up with the will of God. And so here's, here's the prayer, Lord, if it's your will. We talked a little bit about that a couple weeks ago. Lord, your will be done, not mine. If it's your will, rather than I want that new car. Lord, if you want, rather than I need this, that we would surrender our prayers to his will. You know, Elijah holding the rain up for three and a half years. You think that was all Elijah's idea? You think Elijah is like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show that King Ahab who's in charge. No, he was being faithful to what God's will was, that Ahab might know who God is. Do our prayers match that? Are our prayers about people knowing who our God is? Now, the power to save, the power to break strongholds, you know, it talks about confession. 
James tells us to confess. Do you know when you confess things, there's chains that come off your heart on the inside that are, that are making you die inside? When we confess, those break. I don't know how many of you have seen the Passion of the Christ movie that Mel Gibson put out, but uh, we were going to watch it all together here this Thursday. We're not going to do that, but we're encouraging you to watch it. You can actually even see a free version I saw this morning on, on YouTube. You can watch it. It's rated R for graphic violence. If you have young kids, I would highly encourage you not to have them watch that with you. But on Thursday night, I would encourage you to watch it. As a church, we'll be doing that. In the Passion of the Christ, it shows how much God loves us and seeing what Jesus did for us, how he gave himself to give God the glory, but also to give us a way back to God. It's an amazing movie. I remember the first time I saw it, I just... I couldn't speak, I couldn't think, I couldn't talk, which is the same thing as speaking. I couldn't do any of those things for quite a while. It's like, wow. You know what, it it moved other people as well. There's a a story that came out after this on on confession, the Passion of the Christ movie. These confessions that came out that showed... Uh, There was one guy that was a neo-Nazi in Norway. He confessed to a bombing 20 years prior. He wasn't caught, but he confessed to it because he he came with an encounter in Jesus through a movie. He saw how much Jesus loved him. Uh, There was a burglar that went to the police and confessed to six burglaries because he was moved by what Jesus had done for him. A Florida man confessed to a bank robbery from two years prior that he was getting away with. And a young man by the name of Dan Leach in Houston was so moved by what Jesus did, he went and he confessed to killing his ex-girlfriend who was pregnant. They thought it was a suicide. They had just closed the case as a suicide. He had gotten away with murder, and yet the confession came after he saw what Jesus did. When you encounter Jesus, you are changed. When you encounter Jesus, the true Jesus, not some little uh, fuzzy, fluffy Jesus that's just there for you, right? When you encounter the real Jesus and what he went through, you are changed. You become more of who God wants you to be. Confession. We need to break those strongholds. We need to have accountability in our lives. So, so what do we do? Three things. We pray like Elijah. We pray like Elijah. And we go, as, as James says, his, power, his prayer was powerful and effective, and the righteous people. Now, remember, we're only righteous through Jesus. Our prayers are powerful and effective. I love what Kurt Richardson said. Elijah's prayer moved heaven because heaven had been moving Elijah. <laughs> Did you get that? Uh, Elijah's prayer moved heaven because heaven had been moving Elijah. Can the same be said about you and about me and our prayer life? That we are praying and and, and we are working our our time here on this earth for his kingdom. And and we're about, God, whatever you want, your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that's how we're praying. And then all of a sudden when it comes to us asking for something, it's done because we know we lined up with his will, not our own. We need to pray like Elijah prayed. Man, it's effective. It's powerful. It's powerful. We pray a lot around here. Tonight, we're doing our our prayer meeting at 8.05 because our service won't be over till then. But every night at 8 o'clock on Facebook Live, we're doing a little Devo prayer, about 12 to 15 minutes each night. We have prayer meetings throughout the week. I I mean, we just need to be a people of prayer. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 6, praying at all times with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.17, an easy verse for you to memorize today over lunch or or even just now because it's that easy. Pray without ceasing. When do you stop? You don't. Live in a spirit of prayer. Luke 11, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Right? We see this. And the disciples did say, teach us to pray. When you go to our Father in heaven, I have a I have a, a acrostic for prayer. There's one that says ACTS, but mine's different. Mine, you ready? It's C. Everybody do a little C at home. Do a C, right? Confession. Confession. We go before God. I like to put confession before the A because I like to make sure that uh, I am cleansed through the blood of Jesus and I, uh, when, I'm, when I'm approaching God for the A. All right, everybody do A, right? Adoration. We adore God, who he is. Are you ready? All right, then we do the T. Everybody do a T? That one's easy. That's Thanksgiving. Giving Thanksgiving to God for everything, even the breath that we have. And then this one's a little harder. All right, a little harder. It's the S, right? It's the S. 
Some of you can't see sports right now, so I just gave you a little cheer. When you pray, supp- supplicate. They ask us for supplication that we would, we would offer up our prayers to God. May we be faithful to pray like Elijah. May we confess like David. And David was a man after God's own heart. And, and David had, had truly messed up. And you think you messed up? David was a man who had messed up a lot. He had, he had slept with someone who wasn't his wife. He had, he had lied about it. Then he had killed her husband. He had tried this cover-up. He had broken most all the commandments. He almost got away with it. But the conviction of God came into his heart after he was confronted by a prophet. And Psalm 51, don't have time to read the whole thing. But in his confession prayer, man, he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. He goes on to say, behold, you delight in truth and the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the willing spirit. Folks, we have that through the blood of Jesus where we can be washed through the blood and have a restored soul. Confess to God, confess to others. Man, you grow spiritually when you confess to others. I have accountability partners that, that I, I, I confess with on, on a regular basis, things that I'm, I'm struggling with in my life. And, and can I tell you something? Confession is a blessing, not a curse. When we, when we confess, we're opening ourselves up to God and to others to hold us accountable. And the devil wants you to hold on to something because he wants to have that foothold in your life. He wants you to have that struggle that nobody else knows you struggle with. And God says, let it go. Long before Frozen came around, God was saying, let it go. Let it go. Have people that you confess with. Have accountability. Confess like David and be faithful like Paul. Effective prayers are fueled by faith. Don't think that you can call out to say, God, I love you, I want you, and over here you're doing backhanded business against God. And thinking, well, I've said yes to Jesus, so I'm good. God, hear my prayers, and I'm going to go live as an adulterer towards you because I'm going to live for something else. Your prayers won't be effective. It's when you have both hands up to God. And you say, thank you for the righteousness that comes through Christ. Help me to be yours. Be faithful like Paul. Paul was faithful. He lived like this. Faith-filled prayer still works still moves mountains, still heals, and it can heal you today. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's the day to make that happen. For those of you who do, now is coming the time where we celebrate that together in communion. But let me pray for us. Father, thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for Jesus. May we live faith-filled, prayerful lives because they work and they're powerful. And may we pray like Elijah, may we confess like David, and may we be faithful like Paul. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.